Uh, yes, we'll do the yes. I hope that answers Yen Ru's question. We'll do. We'll do live stream, except perhaps uh, YouTube is the one that I'm most familiar with. So, right, we are now. Ah, uh, yes, we'll do the yes. I hope that answers Yen Ru's question. We'll do. We'll do live stream. Okay, so we are now live on the Facebook channel. Right. Uh, I can I can copy and paste this uh, Facebook channel, then you can see yourself there. It's about a twenty second delay usually. Okay. Um. Okay, Yuvaraj is coming in. So once again, to those of you who have just joined us, we just come in. Uh, good evening. We are now live on YouTube. There's a twenty second delay between this Zoom meeting and what you see on live. Um. The purpose of doing this live stream is for to simulate uh, a, a, an advocacy situation where we'll be talking you'll be talking or you will talk to just more than one or more than a few people you may be talking to uh, different stakeholders from different organizations and you may be talking to a big group of people out there whom you might not even see uh, in the public domain okay so um I now will bring up the random, well, number generator, and then you could see that, uh, and then we'll draw lots from there, right? Uh, maybe we should draw three lots at any one go, and then that those are the sequence. Th that will be the sequence uh, in which the teams will present. Shares. Okay. So share screen, random number generator, here we go. Right, I hope you can see the random number generator here. So I put in all the team numbers, minus team seven and five, who will be after six, after 7.30. Right, just a test run. Right, you can see now, just testing it, and some random number will appear. Let's see, right now we have three numbers appearing at the same time. Right, that's how it goes. Right, everyone can see, right? The random number generator. Yes. Okay, I'm now going to click on this, and then the next, the, the three numbers that appear will be the teams that will present from the left, first team, middle, second team, then the right, third team, and then after these three teams, we, we try again this generator. So let's go to the first sequence. Eight, 11, three. Right, so team eight, you are first. And then team 11, you are second, and then team 3, you are third. All right. Once again, team 8, you are first, team 11, you are second, and then team 3, you are third. Okay, I will now uh, bring down this random number generator and also stop share so that team 8 can prepare accordingly. Okay. So now, Team 8, uh, you can prepare accordingly, and um, when you're ready, let me know, and we can start your presentation. Okay, well, well that uh, team is doing their setting up, just reminding us that the time limit for each presentation is 6 minutes, uh, no more than that, excluding questions and answers, and um, yep, at the 6-minute mark, I will cut you off. Uh, can I start? Hi, uh, who is uh, presenting, please? Uh, me, Roshi. And uh, other members? Uh, other, other members also presenting? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just want to make sure my time, uh, what do you call that? Stopwatch is working properly as well. So we are fair to everybody. Just a moment. So do I do I start now? Hang on, hang on. You can hear me, right? Oh. You can hear yes. me clearly, right? Okay. Just a moment for me to get the stopwatch uh, working properly. Yeah. Okay. All right. You have uh, six minutes. You may begin. Go ahead. Good evening, Doctor Wayne and fellow classmates. Looking around you, have you noticed the digital divide across different demographics? 
we are referring to the gap in access to digital technology and the ability to use them. Digital literacy, which is the ability to read and understand online information, could thus be important in bridging this gap. This is what we'll be discussing today, digital literacy, and how we can bridge the digital divide by advocating an intergenerational program. So why is digital literacy important? While 98% of households in Singapore do have access to internet, only 46% of our seniors aged 75 and above who has internet access use it. And among the people who do not use the internet, 55% of them stated that they lack the knowledge to use it. In fact, 12% also stated that they are too old to learn. This goes to show that the lack of digital literacy skills is mainly on the older population. With reference to the TEM model, this could mean that seniors are less able to understand the usefulness and ease of use of IT because of their low digital literacy skills. They form negative attitudes such as technology anxiety, which might result in low use and thus lag behind the rest of the population in the digitalizing world. Next, digital literacy is important on both the individual and macroeconomic levels. On an individual scale, seniors could miss out on real-time updates such as COVID updates and could be more likely to fall for scams. Also, greater technology use was associated with higher subjective well-being, lower depression, and fewer chronic conditions. On a macroeconomic scale, it could result in pressure on healthcare support. A result in Singapore found that acceptance towards digital health services was low, such that if the pandemic continues, about 49% out of 523 respondents chose that they would not use digital medical services. This could imply that they will be going to physical clinics or their conditions might worsen and require more support. Hence, the importance in digital literacy skills so that seniors could easily navigate around online resources. After understanding the importance of the issue, I will now talk about our proposed program, the Intergenerational IT Book Camp organized by the IMB. This program aims to bridge the digital divide for seniors by involving students to act as a cyber guide to help them learn basic IT skills and at the same time foster intergenerational bonding among them. The program is held in primary and secondary schools and to date, 78 schools have hosted 145 boot camps and have seen participation by 3,000 seniors. The boot camp concept is well received by schools and seniors alike and was awarded the highest accolade for its innovative solutions to citizen engagement. The program will take place in the form of a six lesson workshop in which different types of skills would be taught. The program is structured so that the first two sessions will cover basic computer skills to allow seniors to build up confidence in the use of computers. In the next three sessions, seniors will learn about the internet and how to search for information, emails and communication tools, as well as e-entertainment sites. Finally, in the last session, we plan to educate seniors about self-serving banking procedures. Moving on, let me explain the benefits of the program. For students, this offers an opportunity to enhance communication skills and build their understanding of seniors' learning styles. It can also foster a positive mood when they feel happy to have enjoyed a new experience, especially when bonding with seniors in their community and imparting their skills to them. For seniors, this program would help improve their IT literacy and allow them to realize that using technology is not as hard as they thought. It also allows them to independently assess online information. Furthermore, learning about online security, such as privacy settings and avoiding online scams, can elevate their fears towards technology and hence improve their acceptance of using them. Lastly, our seniors will be able to use online communication tools to engage socially with friends and family, improving their well being and reducing loneliness. All right, once we've established an overview of the program that we're advocating, we now discuss the target audience who can help us with the advocacy. In this case, it will be the Southeast Community Development Council. So why did we choose the Southeast CDC specifically? Previously, the bootcamp was co-organized by the Northeast CDC in the Northeast region with great success. We now want to expand the benefits of the program to the Southeast region. As there's a high concentration of both seniors and youth in the Southeast region, running the programs in this area allows us to reach a larger audience to efficiently reduce the low digital literacy uh, nas levels nationally around, among our seniors. 
Next, why would the Intergen Bootcamp suit the Southeast CDC? Firstly, it's a unique and innovative solution that benefits multiple groups of their population and is held in an engaging and motivating manner compared to a typical IT training session. Secondly, the costs to run the program are low as instructors are volunteers, and as little cost to book the venue to conduct lessons as is hosted in schools around the area. Finally, stakeholders like POSB and ben uh, libraries can benefit from the improved digital literacy skills as seniors are able to catch up with the proliferation of digitalizing businesses and services in the region, making sure that no one gets left behind. Now that we've advocated why this program would be good for SECDC, uh, we now list how they can help us roll out the program in line with their missions. First, to assist the needy. We can, uh, they can help to pro promote the program to seniors in need of IT assistance with posters and adverts. Next, by bonding the people, we can improve the social and digital inclusion across the generations. Finally, connecting with stakeholders in the community like schools and businesses form part to form partnerships can provide or alleviate budgets on funding. Thus, by advocating the Intergen IT Bootcamp to the SECDC, we're eager to see an improvement in digital literacy skills of our seniors to ease any fears or anxiety they have towards technology as we move to forward in an ever-digitalizing nation. For more information, we've produced a video with dynamic visuals and text that replicates the Chinese Channel News Asia YouTube videos so that it's professional and engaging at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Prof, you're muted. Hi. Hi, thank you for letting me uh, know I'm muted. And thank you, teammate, for your presentation. Right. Um, just wonder if there are any quick questions from the class. Um, nope. Okay. Um, okay, I think I will save uh, my questions, if any, uh, towards uh, the end or, or comments. So let's move on. Thank you, teammate. Let's move on to the next team. Thank you. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Claire. Hi, yes. Hi. Uh, loud and clear. Good. Okay, nice. Um, I, I'm going to test some technical stuff so that everything runs smoothly. Can you guys see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, that's great. Um, Yeah, so it will, it will be a great help if you guys can prepare. Go into slider and then type in 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3. And then, can you guys see the screen like this? Uh, just wondering. Um, yeah, zero percent yes and no, yeah. Okay, cause I need to share my sound. Uh, oh, no okay. sound at the moment. Good evening, all. Are you here? Today, we'll be focusing on the topic. Well, kind of on and off. Okay, okay, okay. That's great. Um, then I will start then. All right, when you're ready. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can. If today we'll be focusing on the public health issue of depression and elderly. With that, let's get a snippet from a senior Claire. video. Sorry, Claire. Sorry, what? We can't see the video. Oh, you can't see the video? Oh, mm. okay. Yeah, I still at the slider screen. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Okay. It's okay. Okay, I'll start again. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Yeah. Okay, yeah. can see the video now. Great. Okay, thanks guys. Okay. Thanks. Thanks all. Today, we'll be focusing on the public health issue of the pregnant and the elderly. With that, let's look at a snippet from the CNA video. My mom used to be a very nice person. But ever since she had depression, she was getting more anxious, agitation. She was shouting, shouting, and then even fight the person. It is very concerning that in the COVID-19 pandemic, the elderly recorded the highest number of suicides in three decades. Among the various factors that contribute to suicide and mortality in the elderly, depression has been found to significantly lead to a higher suicide rate and higher mortality. The main factors that contribute to depression in the elderly are social isolation, loneliness, and poor perceived social support. Depression is a serious mental health problem among the older adult population. This makes the rise in prevalence of depression particularly worrying. Let's return to the CA video to see what Dr. Chris Soy has to say about the prevalence of depression in the update. What does this imply? Depression in the elderly is under-recognized and under-treated. Why 
is then worthy of our concern. Let's turn to the health and economic impacts of this phenomenon. If left untreated, clinically significant depression in the elderly will lead to functional decline, disability, and comorbid medical conditions. Depression may also increase the risk of subsequent chronic illnesses. These health impacts on the elderly directly imposes on the healthcare system by increasing healthcare expenses. It is therefore clear that the rise of prevalence in depression leads to dire health and economic impacts. Hence, we have to take action to decrease the prevalence of depression in the older adult population. With that, Claire will now elaborate on the current solutions that have been implemented for depression in the elderly. So, so I hope that you have enjoyed the video. And now can everyone please go to slido.com and then key in the code 122333 and participate in this poll. Um, I'll give 10 seconds and I really appreciate if you guys can just play a small role in helping uh, for the audience interaction component. Okay. So as you can see in the poll results, efforts made to address depression in the elderly are insufficient and that more can be done. And here are the existing elderly support groups in Singapore. On first glance, these solutions seem to be sufficient. However, there is a huge problem that our organization believes should be addressed right now. From caregiver dementia, cancer to depression, Existing support groups for the elderly in Singapore are illness-centric. There remains a gap in meeting the needs of a huge proportion of the elderly in Singapore, which is the desire for interaction, connection, and a human touch. Therefore, our group strongly advocates for the provision of holistic and empowerment-oriented support groups in various institution settings in Singapore. We know this will directly address the worrying trends of depression experienced by an increasing number of elderly here. So now I will share the solution. Facilitate intergenerational the intergenerational support groups. It allows us to facilitate intergenerational interactions, providing young and old a chance to give and receive. It will promote social inclusion, tackle loneliness and depression. The details are as follows. A secondary school is to be partnered with an elderly beneficiary group, and each group will be paired with an elderly, encouraging one-to-one -one interactions. The activity conducted will be both online and offline in accordance with the pandemic. For online platforms, they will engage in locally relevant games developed by the activities. For offline platforms, participants will engage in activities like skill swapping or discovery ventures. To the lunch be this will be held once per week for six months to enter regular context. According to Exxon Psychosocial Development Theory, with the main concept being general activity versus action, general activity occurs through intergenerational interactions. Failure to develop these results and disconnection from society. Our intergenerational support groups help to promote general activity, which allows the elderly to stay connected to our society. The benefit of this program for the elderly it aims to promote their psychological well-being by combating social exclusion, loneliness, depression, and their declining sense of self-worth. It allows the sense of fulfillment to be achieved, increasing their physical, mental, and creative activity. Seniors can also find a new sense of purpose in life. They will be empowered. This program will also challenge ageism. Ageist stereotypes and discrimination leads to the marginalization of older adults, contributing to their social exclusion. Support groups to build bridges and close gaps between generations to improve social bonds and solidarity. The fostering of mutual relationships enhances social inclusion, combating loneliness and depression. I would like to quote Bridges Together that intergenerational program are a vaccination against ageism and a prescription for longevity. We said we believe that the intergenerational support groups will empower and combat the rise of depression in elder single. That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Team 11. Thank you, Claire and your team. Right. Um, let's move on then. I think, uh, unless there's somebody who wants to ask anything. Uh, sorry, Prof. Sorry yes. to interject, but I think, uh, I'm not sure if it's connectivity issue, but yeah. I think the video seems to be very choppy just now. Yeah. 
yeah it, it yeah. was also f- uh, on my end the, the video is choppy i think the both of you who watch youtube uh, you will be able to tell that yeah it probably is the the broadcasting uh from claire's side or uh, whoever who yeah yeah but well we could i could still make out the the gist of the video yep so that's good for me yep i uh, hopefully yeah your internet is stable um whoever is sharing the um videos or anything yeah we should move on um thank you claire thank you team 11 um the next one would be team three right yeah okay. i'll be speaking on behalf okay okay yep i can hear you loud and clear okay so um good evening from and friends i'm Rui Tong and i'll be speaking on behalf of team three for the advocacy project, we will be focusing on the Community Psychogeriatric Program, which, which was established in 2007. So we found that many programs advocate for elderly and how to counter loneliness through home visits and activities. However, these programs and policies overlook the mental health aspect when aiding the elderly. Hence, we employed the CPGP as it has services to help the elderly counter psychogeriatric pro- problems and will also be advocating for additional changes to create a more comprehensive program overall. These will be elaborated more on more through a video, which will be shown shortly. Hi, Professor. I'll be sharing the video. Uh, can you all see the screen? No, not yet. Is it? Can you see now? Good. Okay. Hi, just checking if there's anything going on. Um, I don't see anything going on, but a screen. Right, Leticia, are you there? Could be that uh, her computer. Sorry. Had, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I see your screen, but uh, that's oh. Okay. Let me give me a freeze. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me try now. Elderly sense of loneliness is still increasing. Is it working? Looks good. Okay. Do I continue or? Yeah, yeah. You, sh- you. Sh- I, I don't know where you. Yeah, you should start from. Uh, when you switch over, to the video okay. or something. So I think something like that. So we haven't seen any of your your this video yet. If you plan to okay. show, yeah. One of the most pertinent issues that many elderly face in Singapore is loneliness. Additionally, the number of aging population in Singapore is rising and will continue to grow as Singapore's fertility rate continues to decline. As of June 2021, 17.6% of the population are elderly and have significantly grown over the years. It is predicted by 2050, one third of the Singapore population will be elderly, with most requiring some sort of care. Even as of 2020, 70,000 elderly have difficulty carrying out daily activities such as self care. Furthermore, many of these elderly are living alone, which have been found to reduce mental stimulation and social interaction as they usually only go out for essential needs, hence, might go for days without seeing anyone. The numbers of elderly living alone increased from 9.7% to 11%. In 2016 to 2019 as aging challenges arise. Such living situation is also the stem of loneliness in elderly, which then leads to depression. Reports show that elderly who live alone are twice at risk and likely to develop depression than those who are not. More deteriorating implications include suicidal tendencies, contributing to the prevalence of elderly suicide rates in Singapore, which increased by 26% from 2019 to 2020 and can be traced back to loneliness. Additionally, the most common cause of elderly suicide is depression. 
These issues are also aggravated by the pandemic due to COVID measures that prevents them from socializing and losing support networks as well as feeling heightened loneliness. The elderly sense of loneliness is still increasingly salient in Singapore, leading to depression and suicidal tendencies. So what exactly is missing and what more can we do to help them? The Community Psychogeriatric Program, also known as CPGP, was set up in 2007 to provide mental health services to elderly who might face potential psychogeriatric disorders. The CPGP has several aims. 1. Provide mental health services that helps in early detection and treatment for psychogeriatric disorders. 2. Work with caregivers, healthcare and social agencies to meet the psychosocial needs of the elderly. 3. Increase the medical capabilities of family practitioners and community elder care agencies through training, consultation and support. The CPGP provides clinical services for elderly and for patients who reside in a CDC district who are suffering from mental health disorders and have no access to outpatient services. These cases are managed by a multidisciplinary team who will conduct assessment and weekly reviews. For partners and caregivers, help such as training programs to teach caregivers and agencies about early detection of mental health problems, which aids in early intervention. Training will also include ways that the caregivers can care for the elder and aid in group activities. Consultations and support through visits to elder care agencies to aid in resolving special projects. Upon further scrutiny of a program, we have found certain gaps which undermines the overall effectiveness. Allow us to highlight the following four limitations mentioned above. Along with this, we will also be sharing the corresponding solutions that could possibly help bridge the gap and enhance your program. When dealing with elderly depression and suicide, prevention is better than cure. Volunteer befriending of elderly can prevent social isolation and onset of depression. Befrienders provide social emotional support to lonely elderly and maintain positive psychological well-being. CPGP can consider partnership with Lion Befrienders, which helps train and connect volunteer befrienders with vulnerable elderly across Singapore. With the rising number of elderly living alone, it is crucial to ensure there are enough volunteers to support them. As Singapore further eases COVID guidelines, CPGP can partner with Lion Befrienders to organize campaigns and raise awareness about volunteer befriending, especially to young volunteers. Besides prevention, educating seniors about symptoms of depression is also crucial for early recognition of the condition. Such detection of symptoms in themselves or others facilitates early intervention and prevents deterioration of depression. To educate elderly about depression symptoms, they can be shown short informative videos during their annual health checkup. For elderly with hearing issues or only understand dialects, a suitable nurse can personally educate them. CPGP can partner with psychologists or psychiatrists to generate the educational video and equip nurses with basic knowledge of elderly depression. Currently, the CPGP is only implemented in the northeastern and southeastern parts of Singapore, although it is certainly more efficient to channel all the resources to these areas to target the majority of elderly living alone. This does not mean that we should forego the mental health of those who live in other parts of Singapore. From this, we propose for there to be pop-up of more clinics in other parts, and one way to go about doing it could be to expand in one district at a time. By doing so, the CPGP will be able to cater to an even larger population of elderly, a crucial step given our aging population. The CPGP has an exclusion criteria where people with physical disabilities will not be eligible for clinical visits. Yet according to the CDC, adults with disabilities report five times more mental distress compared to adults without disorders. This signifies that the overlooking of individuals with disabilities is countering the purpose of early detection. Hence, it is recommended that the exclusion criteria of individuals with physical disabilities should be removed as they are a group of individuals vulnerable to mental health disorders, elderly or not. And that concludes our proposal. We sincerely hope that the additional solutions that were advocated for would be taken into serious considerations. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, that's it from Team 3. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ratisha. Thank you, Team 3. Right. Um, okay, I want to take this time to ask each of the preceding teams a question. The same question applies to each of the previous teams. So if one person could answer on behalf. Um, my question is, how would your proposed project or program or policy uh, uh, show its impact? That means if say it's impactful, right? Um, what, what, would, uh, what would be visible? What would be observable? Could you say one or two of these? Observable impactful features. Um, should should the impact be shown? Yep. Each of the teams. Hey. Okay. So for team eight, uh, we kind of like went through it in our slides for the benefits of the intergenerational IT bootcamp. So what we will see maybe is like the national surveys. We will see that uh, seniors are more willing to use uh digital devices and that they improve their digital literacy and that we are seeing more a, a larger increase of users on like digital services like banking and library services and yeah we'll see them more independently 
accessing these things. So there'll be less burdens on caregivers. Uh, yeah, and they'll be more like, willing to use these uh, services as well as being like reducing their loneliness and their social ex ex isolation because they'll be able to connect with other people. And so, yeah, mainly these things like improve digital literacy, independence, and socializing. Socializing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Right. Okay. Um. So for group three, like impact wise, I think um because we did mention that we want to increase um, uh, like learning about uh depression symptoms and like loneliness for elderly. So I think like increase um knowledge and um spreading of the word can be, uh, will show its impact eventually in the elderly because they'll be more educated through the visits, um um and the, uh, through the adoption of the CPGP. And also um, additionally, I think like um, we will have an increased sustainable source of volunteers for CPGB itself because they did mention that one of their main problems was that they have a difficulty in terms of manpower. So if they're able to collaborate with uh, Lion Befrienders and um, reach out to more uh, sources of volunteers, I think this will actually encompass and actually create a more cohesive program overall and that it will increase like, community engagement as a whole as to um, individual organizations working by themselves. Thank you, Kai Sin. I can understand the volunteer number will show impact. Um, the knowledge, I just am a bit puzzled or curious. Uh, how, how do we know that knowledge is increased? How would we observe that? Um, okay, so like for us, I think the main point of like the education is not so much of like getting them to like in a sense, like self-diagnosed, is in order to be more aware. So that means, like for example, there are some, uh, um, uh, like symptoms of depression that they might see, um, perhaps in their friends. So like their friends are not coming out as often. They are staying at home, even though they used to uh, meet them a lot and stuff like that. So I think these can be like very uh, minor, minor signs that can lead to um, uh, like bigger symptoms. So if the elderly become more educated of these very minor things, then eventually they'll become more aware, like um, if they are like friends or like some of their family members are experiencing the same things. So overall, it's a better prevention method rather than waiting for professionals to come in to check in on them. So it's a uh, more like protected, like they have a larger area of protection for themselves and like for their friends. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank, th thank you. Yeah. D definitely, the prevention is better than cure. I think you said that. Uh, uh, yeah. In the video, it's just that. Um, Knowledge is a bit challenging to, to measure. It could only happen, uh, you know, gaining knowledge only becomes observable, seems to be only observable in the event that one is presented with a knowledge testing situation in real life, right? I mean, like students, you, you go through an exam, you're tested on your knowledge, right? But, but here we're talking about programs and policy, you know, that uh, first you might need to be educated, health education, psychoeducation, then thereafter, when situation arise, your knowledge is whether it's put to use or we know, right? Um, so I guess perhaps uh, in your write-up, this group, you want to think about how uh, or, or even if it is even feasible to have some measurable way of, um, of uh, observing the, the increase in knowledge right after or soon after the uh, in potential implementation of this proposed program. Yeah, okay. Thanks for the response anyway. Uh, and Team 11, do you have a response Hello. to impact? Yep. Okay, so um, for Team 11, we have um, primarily two measures. The first measure is the primary one, so which is measuring the effectiveness of the intergeneration support group in Singapore. So we will look into like, because our, our solution is to partner one education institute with like a group of seniors. So that is like, in, like that is how we we'll measure from a very specific, uh, more ground up point of view, which is like, like before they attended the support groups, and then after six months, what, uh, to measure the effectiveness and whether like they have see it, seen it improve in their quality of life for both the seniors themselves and also the young people. So that is the our primary form of effective to measure the effectiveness of this program, and then the secondary one is really to look at um, whether there is like a decrease in um, suicide rates in Singapore among the elderly. And we are not saying that um, just one solution will definitely lead to a decrease nationwide. That, that is not true. But we do want to look at how like that can also play a role in helping to facilitate like a uh, lower suicide rate and depression rates among elderly in Singapore on a nationwide basis as well. And then look at the various factors that come into play. So that is our two main ways of measuring success of the program. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. That's very clear to me. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for the responses. Let's move on to the next uh, rounds of presentations. Um, bring up the random number generator again. I think you can see now. So 1, 2, 4, 6, 9, 10, right? So 8, 11, 3 has gone. And then Team 7 will do it later. And then Tahira belongs to... Um, Team 5, which will go later. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, I didn't miss out anyone. Alright, so let me now click the go. Alright. So it will be Team 4 up next, followed by Team 6, followed by Team 9. Right. 4, 6, 9. That's the sequence. Okay, I have stopped share. So I'll let Team 4 do the necessary. Hi everyone. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes, loud and clear, and see you clearly too. Okay, very good. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Right. Um, is everyone able to see the screen? I think it's loading. Good. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. I'll be presenting on behalf of my group. Our topic is on informal caregiving distress. I'm sure all of us here have to some extent a good knowledge about the pertinence and the need to tackle this issue in Singapore. So I really feel that at the end of the day, it boils down to two questions when we um, advocate for the issue. First is, why should you care? For me personally, my reason to care is because my grandmother is in early stage dementia. So while things are still okay at the moment, we're all aware of the prognosis of the condition and the anxiety over the things that will eventually unfold is very real. So I hope that by the time when we have to navigate challenges in caregiving, at least there is some basic knowledge there to guide us. Secondly, given the gravity of the situation, how do we as a collective society care? While our video may not give you the full answers to these two questions, nevertheless, we hope that you could bear these questions in mind and hope our video will help to provide some sense of clarity. Now, without further ado, please enjoy our video titled, Art for the Heart. Hi, my name is Richard. Nine years ago, I left behind my career as an office manager to take care of my adoptive father, John. Dad is 86 and suffers many age-related health issues, including dementia and colon cancer. Not only have these conditions left Dad's life in tatters, they are also taking a toll on my mental health. I get so frustrated. How do I handle him when he starts screaming? I start arguing with him as well. Why are you doing this to me? Why all these things? That was a really hard journey for me and Dad's tantrums are leaving me physically and emotionally drained. The story you have just heard is not fictionalized. It is one of the many real accounts of daily distresses faced by informal caregivers of elder persons in Singapore. In fact, a population-based study found that every one in five informal caregivers of elderly with dementia were psychologically burdened. Many different stresses could contribute to informal caregivers' distress in Singapore. Primary stresses are challenges encountered directly in caregiving, like physically demanding activities of moving the elderly from bed and tensions in the caregiver-care recipient relationship. For instance, Richard's father throws unpredictable tantrums at Richard in the story from earlier on, making him emotionally drained. Moreover, these stresses don't just make the caregiving process itself particularly challenging, they can also extend beyond caregiving to afflict other aspects of the informal caregiver's life. Informal caregivers in Singapore often have to juggle between their work and the caregiving duties, and our notoriously long work hours certainly do not help with that. Caregivers also shared how their self-identity shrunk when they have to give up work for caregiving, like our protagonist Richard. Situations like this can contribute to significant intrapsychic strain. And the future does not seem to go well for informal caregivers in Singapore given various social cultural factors. Firstly, our population is aging. The proportion of elderly 65 years and older is expected to be almost half in less than 30 years' time. These, in light of a higher incidence of long-term degenerative conditions among aging population, means that many more elderly would require assistance in their daily living in times to come. Moreover, many elderly desire aging in place, meaning in their own homes. And what further compounds the issue is the decrease in the size of the nuclear family, denoting fewer adult children available to care for the elder parents. These, coupled with the social cultural expectations of filial piety in the Asian context, means many more younger adults who wish to respect the wish of the other parents to age in place could face caregiving distress. 
So what can we do to help informal caregivers, the many other riches out there in Singapore? The issue is tricky here because as humans, our emotions are so complex that sometimes words fail to describe. Moreover, while many caregivers face distress, the forms and sources of their distress can be very different. So is there a way, a common medium that can unite the similar yet unique experiences of caregivers, allowing them to share the struggles and elevate distress? A promising answer lies in the arts. We propose an integration of art-based therapy into existing community-based caregiver support groups to help alleviate informal caregivers' distress. Arts tell the stories of the soul when words fail. Arts transcend the boundaries of language and can transform the complex and intangible emotions our caregivers face on a daily basis into something tangible, concrete. The procedure begins with a guided visualization by trained art therapists to help caregivers relax. This is followed by art making, whereby caregivers transform the distress into an art piece using any art medium they prefer. Be it clay making, drawing, or crocheting, caregivers will be able to connect with their profound emotions that could not be expressed through words in very creative ways. This facilitates self-expression, self-reflection, and ultimately, meaning making of the distress. Importantly, because we propose such art therapies to be carried out in existing peer support networks, caregivers will be able to bond organically with their fellow caregivers in a journey that leads to finding their common humanity in their challenges. In fact, in Singapore, art therapy paradigms similar to what we have just described have been empirically tested in similar populations such as end-of-life caregivers and have been shown to be effective in reducing burnout and anxiety. While such emotion-focused, evidence-based art therapies do not directly target the sources of informal caregivers' distress, we firmly believe that psychological processing of distress and emotional connection with fellow others in their journey empower our caregivers with the mental capacity and strength to deal with challenges that will continue to come their way. Yes, thank you. So that's all from our group. Thank you, Yanru. Thank you, Team 4. Let's move on to Team 6. Oh, hi. Uh, can everyone hear me? Hi, yeah. Loud and clear. Uh, sure. <coughs> Okay, uh, we shall begin. Uh, good evening, everyone. We are Team 6 and we're representing Project Vital. In recent years, there's a rising aging population in Singapore and issue of greater complexity of care in family caregiving. Family caregiving encourages the main source of caregiving for older adults, giving rise to potential problems such as engaging medical and nursing tasks, feeling unprepared for caregiving, lack of support, and more. Therefore, through Project Vital, videos of daily living activities. We are hoping to collaborate with the Agency for Integrated Care to produce video guides to help caregivers carry out their duties with greater ease. From a survey we conducted of 20 caregivers, the median age of the caregivers was 56, while the median age for our care recipient was about 84. 15 of them reported to be struggling with care tasks. While 12 of them were aware of the AIC brochures, which served as guides for caregiving tasks, all of them did not use it as a resource, as they reasoned them to be too wordy, having poor visuals, and other reasons stated here. But an overwhelming majority would use and prefer video guides if they were made available to them, hence showing a possible justification for Project Vital. We would now like to play a video introducing Project Vital. As the population of Singapore grays, the number of caregivers has begun to rise. In March 2021, there were an estimated 210,000 caregivers. 45% of caregivers needed help or training to provide adequate care for the care recipient. The lack of access to such information can be stressful as caregivers are more likely to worry about making a mistake. The Agency for Integrated Care is an organisation that reaches out to caregivers and seniors with information on staying active and ageing well. AIC has informative brochures on how to carry out various care tasks and assist in activities of daily living. However, their brochures are, in our opinion, worthy, and the visuals are not easy to follow. Any language difficulties the caregivers face will also interfere with their use of the informative brochures. 
Thus, we propose the creation of videos that are dynamic in nature and simulate the steps shown in the brochures. The visual assistants will enable caregivers to be more confident of what needs to be done. It also decreases the burden on primary caregiver as other people in the family can also watch the videos and help out. According to the job demands control support model, when demands are high but the worker has low control, stress occurs. Caregivers might have low control due to insufficient skills or forgetting the skills needed to take care of the elderly, but the demands are high in taking care of the elderly. Instrumental support can be provided by making information about caregiving more accessible to caregivers in the form of instructional videos. Through collaborating with AIC and publishing the how-to videos on your YouTube page, such videos can reach our target audience, caregivers. We will now show a small skit on how these videos can be helpful. Ma, wake up! Your grandson from America is calling you over Zoom. Wow. How do I help her to sit up? I remember Dr. Tan telling me something the other day, but there are just too many instructions. Maybe I can find something in this brochure. Pick her up by the pants? How am I supposed to do that? Hmm. It's okay, there's this QR code here. Let me... Several days later. Boy, I need to go and get some groceries. Make sure Ama eats her lunch. Ah, uh, uh, okay, can, can, can. Ama, make sure doing everything else. Ah, boy, today I'm a bit tired. Can feed me. Ah, feed you, ah. Mm. Okay, oh. Uh, I, I think the portion too big. Can less. Ah, this one too big, ah. Uh? Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Can, can pass me the water? My throat a bit dry. Water, you take Ma, can you be more careful or not? <sighs> yeah, how to feed Ama like this? Ah? I don't call Ma. Eh, Ma also cannot reach. Then how to? Eh? What's that? Ah? Oh, how to feed Ama? But where, where, where they? How to? Eh? Got QR code here. Sorry, Amma. I try to take you slowly, okay? As you can see, in support of our survey findings, our videos have a large impact on the community as it supports primary and informal caregivers as well as other family members of the elderly. Due to the variety of how-to videos presented, it will also aid them in performing many tasks. And with that, we are at the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Team 6. Thank you, Yuvaraj. Right, uh, let's move to the next team, Team 9. Can everyone see the screen? Yes, I can. It's on the slides, right? Oh, good, I can see your Silver Gaming project. So let's start. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, good evening. So today, Group 9 presents the Silver Gaming Project. Our project aims to develop scientifically backed games 
video games for the elderly is a preventative and rehabilitative intervention for the aged who are at risk or suffering from non-degenerative diseases. So now let's watch a video on our project. I think there's no sound. You may have forgotten to connect the sound. Sorry, is there no sound? Yeah, I can't hear it. Singapore's population size is expected to reach 6.34 million in 2030. Is there sound now? Yes, good. Okay. Based on projections from the United Nations released in 2019, by then there will be 806,000 people under 15 years old and 1.8 million people who are aged 65 years or older, making up about 28% of the total population. The numbers will reach 722,000 and 3.08 million respectively out of a total population of 6.58 million by 2050. What does it mean? It means that in about three decades, almost half of Singapore's total population will be at least 65 years old. Globally, there are nearly 48 million people who suffer from dementia, and unfortunately, 82,000 Singaporeans are among them. Around half the population show symptoms by the time they reach 85 years. Findings reveal that 1 in 10 individuals above the age of 60 years can develop this disease. The financial strain of dementia may reach up to trillions of dollars. Nearly $3 million went into dementia care in Singapore alone in 2015. Let's admit, these figures are daunting and it will strain our healthcare resources in time to come. And this is why our team chose to work on this topic. So what are the main problems we have identified? One common issue faced is that the elderly do not readily adopt new technology and the elderly do not exercise their cognitive abilities frequently or intensely enough into their old age. However, findings have shown older adults are slower to adopt new technologies than younger adults, but will do so if those technologies appear to have value, for example, in maintaining their quality of life. According to Herzog et al., the concept of cognitive enrichment, which aims to attenuate neurodegeneration in the elderly, works on various levels, providing the elderly with stimulating activity. Nintendo's Brain Age and Brain Age 2 have seen some success in the sphere of brain training. Moreover, more literature has proven that it is beneficial for the elderly when they play games. There is a significant improvement of the cognition of AD patients, better performance on a hippocampal dependent task for middle-aged people, and greater improvement in range of motion, strength, and hand velocity in stroke patients. As seen, there are advantages to playing video games and VR, more so than what we might think. The requirements of a VR system for stroke rehabilitation were established and incorporated into Rehab Master. The reported advantages from the usability tests will improve attention, immersive flow experience, and individualized intervention. The previous studies have proven that VR can improve motor function in patients with stroke. Another study, conducted by Stark and colleagues, found that benefits in middle age parallel effects previously observed in young adults playing Minecraft, showing improved memory performance on hippocampal dependent memory tasks. Similar results were found in a Montreal study where participants who played Super Mario 64 gained hippocampal grey matter in 6 months, while their non-gamer counterparts did not. Keeping the elderly free of neurodegenerative diseases is not only beneficial to them, but also the wider society around them. The burden of caregiving and financial costs can be reduced by these preventative measures if implemented early, as seen in the Minecraft study. In the long run, this will have a positive impact on societal welfare and health as a whole. We wish to better the lives of the elderly by decreasing the progress of neurodegenerative disease. Thus, we need the expertise of you, software developers. And we also need researchers researching cognitive psychology to come on board with us. With your first-hand knowledge and findings, you will be able to collaborate seamlessly with the software developers. 
From existing research, the elderly will experience slow progression into their disease after exposure to the games. It is suggested that developed games target brain regions such as the hippocampus. Research has also shown that intense cognitive load stimulated cognitive activity among elderly participants who went back to school, causing them to have similar levels as adults 30 years younger. This means that the games developed must be challenging enough to stimulate the elderly while being fun. The current generation of youths will eventually become old, but this generation has grown up with exposure to advances in technology and gaming. Creating a serious game based on scientific research could help in elderly neurodegenerative prevention and rehabilitation and would be a candidate for gaining a large share of the market, perhaps even creating a new niche market in the gaming industry. Also, the earlier you get into the market, the more advantage it will be for the company to establish dominance within this niche. You never know, software developers and researchers might get the next Nobel Prize for their inventions and every old person might have your game in their house. So what are you waiting for? Our elderly in Singapore need you. Singapore's population Okay, so we are currently looking to engage in developers and researchers to come on board. So the former will take care of IT and game development aspect of the project, while the latter will handle the scientific side of the game development process and they will carry out the steps necessary to give our games in scientific time. So our roadmap is as follows. We are currently in the stage of game creation. So after the game is um, created, we will do a pilot launch of it in community clubs. Community clubs in Singapore are popular hangout for the elderly, which allows us to maximize our reach of games. As we are aiming to popularize it, so in the last stage, we will distribute the game in the market, which makes it available for all use, which can penetrate the rest of the population who are elderly who may not go hang out in the cities. Also, why did we choose drone technology as our topic of interest? We as a younger generation have access to technology, and in fact, we use it in our daily lives. For instance, some of us here might play Minecraft, and are already exposed to the virtual 3D environment, which would require us to use certain parts of our brain and also our spatial awareness. Thus, we hope that through feedback and continued refining of the video games, we will be able to roll out more additions of video games that will be benefit elderly with dementia or people at risk of dementia. So, <clears throat> our target audience was software developers, and what's in it for them to gain? Well, they can help society benefit from easing the burden of neurodegenerative disease and they can also get um, financial gain and become like industry leaders and so on so that's why we try to appeal to software developers and uh, yeah that's the end of our presentation thank you thank you thank you team nine All right An Sheng and Ri Xian and uh, Chloe thanks um, well I just have a comment quick comment on Team Nine, um, when you say cognitive psychologists, I think you really are interested in neuroscientists and neuropsychologists, uh, right? Uh, to to collaborate with software developers, the the, the neuroscientists uh, would 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 be able to uh, uh, discuss the parts of the brain that are supposed to uh, uh, that are, that are implicated, and the neuropsychologists will be able to link that with motivation and behavioral change of an older person and then the software developer could uh, implement those in the interface a um, uh, quick comment on team four's presentation um, you, you propose art based therapy and meaning making uh, I think that really is the active ingredient meaning making um, the roots of that actually comes from to my knowledge uh, work in dementia uh, in Singapore it is uh, I think you took work from Andy Ho that is end of life care. Um, we don't have yet uh, in Hong Kong. We have uh, in fact uh, meaning making and art based therapies uh, surrounding dementia care already. Um, that's my comment for team four, and to team six. I just want to ask a quick factual question: How many survey participants? Uh, twenty. Twenty. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
Thank you. Um, that was, uh, I, I think AIC would be interested in that uh, finding you have and how you translated that, uh, that uh, what do you call that, that uh, pamphlet uh, or brochure into um, something that's visible. Okay, I think uh, due to time, we should move on. Um, let's move on. I hope the other teams five, you're here already. Team seven, are you here? Just checking. Yes, uh, give me a thumbs up uh, virtually or... Oh real okay good I see Ben I see so here are good <laughs> team five is here team seven um, are you here team seven yes excellent good all right so back to the random number generator again uh, right and uh, so I'll put team seven and five into the generator as well so now we would uh, draw lots okay here we go Five and seven are there. Let's draw lots. Okay, your next team is team seven, followed by team one, followed by team ten. Right, so seven, one, ten in that sequence. Okay, let's go. Um, the next team you can get ready. Hi, can I check if y'all can see the slides? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Good. Thanks, Prof. So when you're ready, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear, thanks. Okay, so give, good evening, everyone. We are Edison, Joy, and Ling Xuan from Group 7, and we are here today to propose to you SA Connect, a program aimed at improving the current infrastructure available to tackle elderly loneliness. Please enjoy the following video, which will explain more about it. This is Auntie May. Auntie May lives alone as her husband recently passed away and her family rarely visits her. And this is Auntie Mary. Auntie Mary suffers from severe arthritis, which prevents her from getting out of the house to meet her friends. Auntie May and Auntie Mary are not isolated cases of elderly loneliness. A recent study conducted in Singapore found that over 32% of participants aged 60 to 69 years felt lonely, and this percentage increased to over 40% of participants aged 80 to 89 years. So, what is loneliness? One way it can be conceptualized is through the cognitive discrepancy hypothesis, which suggests that feelings of loneliness may develop as a result of minimal social interaction or when there is a disparity between an individual's expectations and the reality of their social interactions. Upon entering the later stages of life, the elderly face multiple physical, psychological, and social challenges. These challenges include firstly, the loss of loved ones. Aging individuals become more selective in their relationships. As such, the loss of these selected relationships may be very painful and make it hard to form new ones. Secondly, Functional disability due to various age-related diseases can limit mobility and increase social isolation, which is a precursor to loneliness. A failure to adapt to these challenges at this stage of life will likely result in fewer or unsatisfactory relationships and possibly lead to feelings of loneliness. Given that loneliness is a risk factor for various health conditions like stroke, depression and mortality, there is an urgent precedent for agencies concerned with elderly well-being such as the Agency for Integrative Care, or AIC, to tackle late-life loneliness. Fortunately, the AIC is well-equipped to tackle elderly loneliness through its Senior Activity Centres, or SACs, which aim to help seniors find support among similarly aged peers. Located in neighbourhoods with many elderly residents and boasting a myriad of programmes, they have the capability to combat feelings of loneliness among seniors by helping them foster social bonds with their neighbours. Although, one challenge that SACs may be facing is their underutilization. A study found that only 9% of the elderly actually attend the SACs programs and activities regularly. This could be attributed to two reasons. Number one, that physically able elderly residents are unaware of an SAC in their neighborhood and the programs it conducts. And number two, that functionally impaired elderly residents find it difficult to leave their homes to attend the programs. Therefore, there has to be a solution which addresses these two issues. 
we would thus like to propose Essay Connect, a program which aims to complement the SEC's work through the use of a digital platform. This program first involves the creation of a mobile application, which could include features that make it easier for users to find out about the SEC's activities, locate the nearest centre, and communicate with loved ones interested in participating in the activities. The application could also have a video calling function, enabling homebound residents to join the programs online and interact with others at the centre. Other elderly-friendly features include simple instructions, multiple languages, and a help centre for those not well adapted to using their smartphones yet. The next step of the program involves SAC volunteers who will visit the elderly residents and teach them how to download and use the app. This is a vital step, as technology-based tools are only effective if the elderly are taught how to use and obtain them. There are various reasons why we believe SA Connect is an effective program for the AIC to invest in. Firstly, it is able to reach out to a large number of elderly residents. In Singapore, the usage of smartphones among the elderly was 60% in 2020, and this percentage is still growing. Therefore, tapping on a technological device which many elderly residents already use is an efficient way to reach out to them. Secondly, it ensures that elderly with little experience with technology will be able to use the application. Based on the technology acceptance model, seniors must view an application as easy to use before they are willing to try it. The availability of volunteers, a help centre function and elderly-friendly features will help the elderly quickly familiarise themselves with it and encourage its usage. Thirdly, it allows homebound elderly to join the programmes. Based on the theory of planned behaviour, the need to physically be at the centre makes it perceivably difficult for those with restricted mobility to join the activities, dissuading them from participating. The option to go online allows the homebound to join the programmes and make friends. So, with the SA Connect app, Auntie May now regularly attends the SAC's arts and crafts activities. There, she befriends Auntie Mary, who through the SA Connect app also attends activities virtually. Okay, to round up the presentation, there are, here are some reasons why you should implement SA Connect. Firstly, it is efficient as it reaches out to a larger number of elderly residents. Secondly, it is an elderly friendly app as it caters to seniors with various levels of technological expertise. And lastly, this program is inclusive as it also incorporates elderly residents who are homebound and are unable to physically attend. So let's SA connect as we are stronger together. Thank you. Now let's leave here are some reference. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Team 7, Ling Xuan, Joy and Alison. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next team. Okay, so I'll be starting off uh, group one's presentation. Um, uh, okay, so I'll just introduce my team. I'm Akila. We have Lintin, Daphne, and uh, Yuan Lu. And for our project, we decided to do a podcast kind of style to tackle the issue of insom insomnia in uh, the elderly. So now I'll be sharing my screen to show you guys the video. Hang on now. Uh. Okay. Uh, Prof, can you see my screen? Um, yes, yes. Okay, all right. I'll play the video now. Welcome to another episode of Gerald Podcast, where we discuss problems faced by the elderly in Singapore. This week, we'll be looking at insomnia in older adults. So I was actually the one to suggest this topic. I went to visit my grandmother yesterday for the first time. Oh, in sorry. Uh, and she told the me that she had trouble sleeping. But we can hear the sound. It's been happening sorry? more frequently. Uh, I can hear the sound, but uh, I don't know about others, or is it just me? I can hear the, the speech, but not okay. the, the visuals. Uh, I see a free oh. screen of uh, your first frame. Okay, okay. Uh, let me try and share it again. You want to try again, yeah. And I'm really starting to get worried about it. Does it work now? episode of Gerald Podcast, where we discuss problems faced by the elderly in Singapore. This week, we'll be looking at insomnia in older adults. 
So I was actually. Um, okay, so maybe one be another of your yeah of your team can share that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe that's that just, just. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you want to try turning off your video, you can. But I'm not sure that might help. That that okay. will help or not help. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to refresh my YouTube video if that helps. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. No. Where we discuss problems faced okay. by the um, in the, No. I think what I will do is I'll leave the link in the chat box. Then I think no. uh you guys can just check out the video that way because I don't think it makes sense if the video isn't moving anyway. Um Okay, sure. Yeah, so sure. Sure. I mean yeah. alternatively I'll one of your supervise. other team members yeah. could uh could share the video. Me. If yeah, you, I think you can try. I don't know if that helps. I think it's just internet uh, connectivity and bandwidth. Yeah. Excellent. Oh no. Um sorry now there's no sound. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Gerald Podcast, where we discuss problems faced by the elderly in Singapore. This week we'll be looking at insomnia in older adults. So I was actually the one to suggest this topic. I went to visit my grandmother yesterday for the first time in a while and she told me that she had trouble sleeping again. It's been happening more and more frequently and I'm really starting to get worried about her. Then when I googled about it, I found that other older adults also have the same problem. Almost 70% of older adults in Singapore experience sleep interruptions at night and almost half of them reported having trouble falling asleep. These are symptoms of insomnia disorder according to the 5th edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders or the DSM-5. However, there are no numbers on how many people actually have sleep disorders in Singapore. Honestly, I think it just highlights how little attention is given to sleep disorders. Apparently, there are some sleep clinics in hospitals, but my grandmother thinks it's not worth the money and she refuses to go. Still, I really want to help my grandmother, but I don't know what I should do to help her. I see, your grandma may also be lonely, which is pretty common among elderly. In fact, Daphne and I have read about My Body Program, a home visit defending program under the organization of senior volunteers that caters to socially isolated or lonely elderly who are above the age of 60. Wow, sounds interesting. What is it about? Natalie and colleagues showed that loneliness contributes to insomnia, which this program hopes to grapple with. Being there for the elderly can make a world of difference to them, especially those at risk of isolation. The lack of interaction between the younger generation and the elderly is due to generation gap and language barrier, or simply due to having a lack of time, like you. Hence, this program aims to tackle this and improve the quality of life of the elderly. Also, it's free of charge. Wait, doesn't that sound like any normal buddy program? My buddy program is different. It actually encourages elderly to be volunteers. This is so that care receiver and volunteer can relate to elderly issues. Don't worry, the volunteers will be equipped yeah. with the necessary knowledge yeah. to understand and provide daily assistance to isolated elderly, improving their quality of life. How does this address insomnia and improve quality of life? The Buddy Program has a sub-program known as Enriching Lives of Seniors Program to encourage active living. The program entails activities such as exercises and cognitive activities like puzzles, hence decreasing sedentary lifestyle. Moreover, Kim and colleagues showed that older adults with high social and cognitive activity engagement are likely to have fewer insomnia symptoms. Also, we can use a Fitbit to track their quality of sleep, such as sleep duration. This is an indicator to ascertain that the problem helps for their insomnia. Thus, it is a win-win situation for both the elderly and volunteers as they are engaging in healthy living. Moreover, a great dyadic interaction like this contributes to the increase of quality of life. The link between dyadic bonding, loneliness, and quality of life. A diet is composed of two people who relate to each other. As stated by Fakwa and Frank and colleagues, engaging activities allow for more physical combat and companionship, which help the elderly to build social connectedness. This decreases 
cortisol and stress level, which allow the elderly to interact more with others. Moreover, more interaction helps the elderly to feel more tired, decreasing episodes of insomnia. This also strengthens the elderly and volunteer dietic bond. Ensuring the elderly are not alone in this world alleviates loneliness and thus increases the quality of life. I see. Sounds like a great program. How do you reach out to the elderly though? So actually, I'm currently working with this design team to make advertisements raising awareness about sleep disorders in the elderly. And it actually comes with resources on where to find help too. So for my final year project in university, I did research on this topic and brought it up during our design team's uh, brainstorming session. So it actually intrigued me that the elderly could face such issues too, considering that because of uh, old age, I thought that it would actually fall asleep easier and not face such problems, but it doesn't seem to be the case. That's really interesting. Could you share more about the kind of advertisements you created and where we can find them? Of course. So we're actually partnering with the Health Promotion Board, HPB, and uh, Singapore Mass Rapid Transit, SMRT, to place these ads at uh, HDB blocks and transport locations where the elderly will likely frequent, which is really exciting. Um, Psychology-based research can be jargon-heavy, so to tackle this issue, we use infographics to break down the issue for them, and a very simple step-by-step -step process of how they can get help. Above all, our objective is to let them know that they are not alone in facing sleeping problems and that finding others like them can help them feel less isolated. We are also intending to promote the buddy program to reach out to more elderly persons. So in summary, we discussed quite a number of points and I really learned a lot from today's session from all the different perspectives and I'm ready to help out wherever I can. So for starters, maybe I can share the learning points from today's podcast with the elderly at the Old Folks Home where we're volunteering next week. As always, email us at jerapodcast at gmail.com and we'll try our best to get to as many issues as possible. Till then, signing off. <laughs> Sorry. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right, good. Okay, so I'll be summarizing what was going on in the video just now. So for the learning outcomes, to sum up, the prevalence of insomnia in the elderly, as shown in our video earlier, is pretty rampant. However, there is little awareness on how to grapple insomnia with minimum costs, taking into consideration that most elderly are retired. Moreover, loneliness is one of the salient factors that contributes to insomnia, and if no companionship is available, the loneliness may exacerbate insomnia. Hence, my group put forward my body program as it will be beneficial for both the volunteer and elderly as it keeps them company and active. Thus, my body program helps to curb loneliness and consequently insomnia. Last but not least, we chose to advocate the program via podcasts and posters as my group felt that they are one of the hassle-free ways for information to be accessible and available for the public to turn to if they are facing similar issues and in need of help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Group 1, uh, on your presentation on sleep disorders, insomnia. Right, let's move on to Group 10. Can you see the screen? Yes, good, okay. Alexis. Yep, good. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, so I'll be giving a brief overview of our project. Um, group 10 aims to create an app which uses online games to educate seniors on online scams and technology usage in an engaging and accessible way to encourage self-sufficiency in learning. Um, this is to counter the increasing prevalence of online scams uh, which have elderly victims. And also due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as social activities are limited, these games also provide a platform to counter isolation and to improve cognitive well-being of elderly. Um, our main stakeholder for this project will be the Infocom Media Development Authority in Singapore. And we hope that IMD collaborates with us firstly because of the relevance of their existing initiative, Seniors Go Digital, to our project. Secondly, as a financial investor to aid us in the marketing and development of the application, as well as to um, provide updates to maintain the relevance and the frequency of the app. And finally, um, since Senior School Digital already has an existing audience base to whom we can promote the app to and to provide them with additional learning resources. And ultimately, we hope to build upon and grow the platform of the IMDA's existing initiative. And we'll show a video now to you.
Let me know if y'all can share the audio. Oh no, no audio. This is Jane. She okay, is 65 good. years old. Unbeknownst to her, a single SMS is about to change her life, or more specifically, her life savings balance. With the press of a URL, Jane had lost $40,000 to an online scam. The woman was too stunned to speak. This is based on true events. The elderly are attractive targets to cyber criminals in Singapore. Studies have shown that susceptibility to scams is positively associated with age. Adults over 65 are 35% more likely to have lost money to scams than those in their 40s. Furthermore, people aged 50 and above register the highest year-on-year -year increase in internet use, heightening their exposure to cyber predation. In 2019, the Singapore Police Force's Anti-Scam Centre recovered about 40% of the $52 million lost to scams. That still leaves millions in unrecovered funds. Elderly victims of scams also have fewer opportunities to recover from financial losses due to retirement or disability. This can result in a loss of independence and cause them a great deal of distress. An existing program that teaches seniors digital skills is the Senior Go Digital Initiative by the Infocom Media Development Authority, hereafter known as the IMDA. However, there are limited ways in which seniors can apply their learnings in a realistic environment. Furthermore, this does not tackle other factors that increase susceptibility to scams, such as lower cognitive function, well-being, and literacy. Our proposed solution aims to combat these issues of cyber safety while simultaneously promoting successful aging. By building on the existing Seniors Go Digital initiative, we aim to educate seniors on the methods to identify scams through online games. Our target is to collaborate with this government initiative and utilize existing research to create a sustainable and engaging method of educating elderly about scams and technology usage. The existing initiative launched by the IMDA provides a variety of programs and online classes targeted towards acquisition of digital skills, one of these being identifying scams. However, studies on the existing program have found that while seniors have the motivation to participate and use technology, Within a year of the program's development, only 4% of the senior population of Singapore have been using those SGD resources. Therefore, our application aims to target this shortcoming by making resources widely available with low costs. In addition to reducing the amount of seniors falling prey to online scams, we aim to tailor this application to promote successful aging. The SGD program follows a more teacher-student approach with programs and classes, whereas this game application would try to integrate tech education into daily life. These types of games would improve cognitive abilities of seniors through increasing memory retrieval and problem-solving skills. An existing study found that peer teaching is an effective way to share information among seniors. Widespread adoption of this game could allow the seniors to teach each other about what they have learned through the game, as well as interact with each other on the application themselves. This method would allow for an increase in staff-senior ratio, and digital ambassadors could focus on the research aspect of improving the application as opposed to having to educate this, each senior individually. The proposed program is an interactive game application that aims to educate seniors about online scams and technology usage. Our game will model after the topics covered in Senior School Digital, such as the ones listed here. However, with the pressing need and importance of addressing cybersecurity, there will be a greater emphasis on this topic, more specifically, online scams. Quizzes that assess seniors' learning after each topic can be adapted into games that seniors are familiar with. For example, common terms regarding online scamming can be used in a crossword puzzle. Seniors can also play Spot the Difference games to differentiate between authentic and fake websites, logos and URLs. This will aid in improving the cognitive abilities of seniors as well. The onset of the pandemic has limited social interactions of seniors. Hence, this game would include a multiplayer mode where seniors can learn and play with their friends online. A limitation of Senior School Digital is that its physical training sessions ostracize those who have difficulties in mobility and leaving the house. Thus, our digital application will be able to solve this issue, as seniors can access it remotely from their homes. Our key stakeholder for this project will be the IMDA. Our team requires financial resources to aid in the marketing and development of the application, as well as maintenance and updates to sustain the quality of the app. 
Furthermore, the IMDA can capitalize on its existing audience base from Seniors Go Digital and promote this application to more seniors. Thank you for your kind attention. This is Jane. She right, thank you. Right, thank you, Team 10, for your presentation. Um, I just want to do a quick check. Uh, team 7 and Team 1, who are your target audience or stakeholder of your media project? Um, if I can go first, yeah. So, uh, for group one, I would say that our target audience is uh, first like we did a podcast format. Um, the name of our podcast is Stereo Podcast, right? So it's an it's a, essentially a podcast about um issues that the elderly face. Right. So it, it's actually targeted towards both the the younger generation to like kind of educate them about these issues, as well as the elderly because they themselves may not be aware of such issues that other like other of their peers may face so that's our target audience right so uh so akila thanks for the response so team one is like a public education you know older person yes. and younger person so it's almost yes. the public right yeah, yeah okay sure so i guess uh one input i can give for you each of you to think about in your ca5 write-up is is um how you how this might be how how a, a targeted audience might be uh, identified or if let's say any of the if let's say the uh, what do you call that if let's say um, whether to what extent would one or more targeted audience or identified targeted audience would help carry forward uh, your the implementation that you so passionately uh, advocated in your you know via your podcast you know so so I guess you can think about that I mean that is it, there's a lot of value in public education it's just that sometimes uh, everyone think that everyone else is doing it and nobody is doing it, you know. Um, so you might want to think about that. Uh, thank you. Uh, team 7. Hi, Prof. Yeah, so for our group, the target agency was actually the uh, agency for integrative care. They are the ones that oversee all the senior activity centre. But we didn't explicitly say that, uh, oh, we are only targeting the AIC because we kind of wanted our video to sort of just be like an advocacy project for the benefits of using a digital platform such, an, such as an app. So um, other, you know, elderly um, catered organizations can also uh, yes, probably learn I from our video as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. AIC would, 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 would watch that and take home some inputs. I'm sure many other senior mm -hmm. care organizations as well and even the public mm -hmm. as well. But I guess I can see AIC. Now, the thing is this, SACs, right? Senior Activity Centers mm -hmm. and Organizations, as well as AIC, right? Um, I think we all kind of hear uh, and know that they have so many other needs to take, think about and to care for. Mm. How would uh, your team, how would you kind of persuade them to prioritize this if you have to? Um, to prioritize the app that we're proposing, is it? Yeah, your program, your uh, SA Connect. Okay, Um, I think for us, firstly, of course, we brought up the problem of loneliness. It is a very... um important problem to tackle. And also the Agency for Integrative Care, they have a lot of organizations that sort of tackle like other elderly issues as well. So perhaps one way we could um, help to get them to, uh, to invest in the app is to also show that loneliness is actually a risk factor for a lot of other issues. And then it was sort of like snowball into probably things that they'll just have to tackle in the future. Yeah, so this is sort of like the first step. And it's also the easiest step, right? It's just to get the elderly and to do some art activities. It's very low investment, I would say, uh, in the sense of like, it, it, it's an early intervention. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank it's you. something. Yeah, you can you can think about in your you know write up. Uh, because these organizations we know they are so called one stop agency for many things. Uh, they can be very distracted at times. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the final three teams. Uh, it's quick one. Uh, quick drawing lots to see who goes. Uh, finally, the last three teams. Uh, here we go. Two, five, and twelve. We draw a lot right now. Okay, so 12, then 2, then 5, right? In that order, 12, 2, 5. Okay, let's go ahead.
Yes, I can. In the edit mode, PowerPoint. Okay, good. I see your slide presentation now. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, begin when you're ready. Okay. Uh, good evening, Prof. Wayne and fellow classmates. I'm Pearlie and together with Yen Song and Tien, we are group Retire Better. So today you'll be learning from us on how to retire better and we'll be advocating for a proposed plan in the context of Facebook. So to begin, we will start with proposal here. Have you started financial planning for your retirement? If yes, that's great to hear, but still do follow us through to find out more about financial planning for retirement and its importance. We've identified poor financial planning for retirement as an issue because the survey found that two in three Singaporean retirees regret not planning for retirement early. Also, eight in ten Singaporeans still underestimate the retirement amount that they require by 31%. According to the role theory, retirees often take on different roles after retirement and usually choose to either play a bigger role in their family or pursue their own interests, which requires financial resources. So, according to the continuity theory, retirees will still want to continue to enjoy their preferences from pre-retirement, therefore adequate retirement funds are also crucial. Planning for retirement early will allow individuals to have more time to benefit from the effects of compounding returns, have a better standard of living after retirement, and have sufficient savings for healthcare expenses. Did you also know that for a one-person elderly household, basic needs would cost 1421 per month? However, CPF basic retirement fund the retirement sum only pays out 800 per month and the silver support scheme only covers 11 to 21 percent of what is needed. Hence, the amount paid out per month is insufficient and cannot be solely relied on. Adequate planning and savings would better enable retirees to sustain their lifestyles. As a solution to our identified problem of poor and late financial planning for retirement, we'd like to advocate for the implementation of the financial education program by Institute for Financial Literacy through the use of this video we created. For students, such programs or workshops that fall under the Family and Youth program are more suitable and applicable. Workshops like Money Sense for Your Child and Money Management for Youth will enable them to gain some financial literacy knowledge, such as the importance of inculcating good financial habits, useful money management skills and concepts, how to use basic financial products and services to manage their money in terms of goal setting and budgeting. For employees, workshops that fall under the Money Management and Retirement Program will be more applicable. Through these workshops, employees will be more equipped with relevant resources and knowledge to adequately plan for their retirement. They will be taught how to plan for a comfortable retirement, steps to take to understand their current available resources and their own future needs, how much retirement funds they require and the importance of digital financial literacy and how it helps them make better financial decisions. This will allow employees to take more initiatives and ownership in planning for their own retirement. How would financial literacy classes solve the problem of inadequate financial retirement planning in Singapore? First, financial literacy classes equip individuals with knowledge that guide financial planning for retirement, leading to improved financial retirement planning. Singaporeans are not really financially literate. A survey conducted found that about one-third of Singaporean men and nearly half of Singaporean women do not hit the threshold for being financially literate. This lack of financial knowledge leads to a poorer ability to plan for one's financial future, especially in the area of retirement planning. Research suggests financial literacy to be positively associated with retirement planning behaviour, and greater confidence in financial knowledge leads to a higher propensity to plan for retirement. 
The financial knowledge acquired from financial literacy courses can hence reduce the economic and psychological barriers to retirement planning. Financial literacy classes hence enable individuals to gain knowledge on concepts related to financial literacy and key information needed to better plan for their financial needs in retirement. It also equips individuals with skills to manage and grow their finances, providing concrete guidance to improving financial well-being in retirement. Next, the availability of financial literacy classes for youth enable them to start young. While it may be slightly early to start preparing for retirement, more knowledge and skill on managing finances can help youth to get a head start in planning. The notion of saving and planning for retirement is made salient in the minds of youth and they are hence better prepared to handle retirement planning and are well equipped to do so when the time comes. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you, Team 12, for, on your presentation, for your presentation on retirement. Um, let's move on to Team 2. Hi, sorry. So this is Team 2. My name is John. Uh, we'll try to keep this within six minutes. Huh? Thank you. Okay, just give me a while. I didn't understand. All right, good. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Group 2 will be presenting our advocacy program of mindfulness-based therapy for insomnia, MBTI, not to be confused with the Myers-Briggs type indicator to tackle insomnia in the elderly. Now, let us start with a short video on insomnia. Uh, I think there's no audio. Oh, there's no audio? Yeah, only the video stream, but there's no audio thing. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, does this have sound? Do we have sound? No, not now. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's try again. So the still no sound. Oh no! Just give me a while. I'm so sorry. Sure, maybe it's your your sharing. Um, there's an option to click share sound with video. Mm -hmm. Maybe you forgot to click on that on Zoom. Um, audio set is it under audio setting? It's uh, maybe you maybe you stop share and then okay sure uh, let me share stop share. Stop share. Okay. On the bottom left, I think there's a share oh, sound. Oh, share sound. All right. That Thank you. Must be click. Yeah. Oh, sorry about it. So let me retry again. Is this all right? Good. Loud and clear. At 87 right. years of age, Flo has been experiencing increasing sleep difficulties at least three times a week for at least three months. This has been interfering with her daily functioning. As such, Flo has been unable to concentrate on her daily chores and hobbies. Every night, Flo is unable to initiate sleep despite her best efforts. Even after falling asleep, she wakes up multiple times through the night. Eventually, 
She wakes up in the wee hours of the morning and is unable to get any more sleep. Unbeknownst Flor, she has been suffering from a sleep disorder known as chronic insomnia. A worldwide study in 2020 found that 49% of Singaporeans reported dissatisfaction with their sleep, with insomnia accounting for 28% of all sleep disorders. Another study found that 13.7% of older adults age 60 and above reported sleep problems. Insomnia also leads to several negative outcomes including daytime drowsiness, fatigue, cognitive deficits, increased likelihood of accidents, reduced physical and mental health, lowered quality of life, decreased productivity and mortality. Individuals were significantly more likely to have a range of chronic physical and mental conditions including heart problems, paralysis and depression. Elderly patients 60 years and above with persistent insomnia are more likely to develop major depressive disorder MDD and 3.5 times more likely to remain depressed even after treatment. Elderly women with insomnia are 6 times more likely to develop MDD compared to those without. Current methods of treatment of insomnia include sleep hygiene, which are habits and practices that may contribute to getting a good night's sleep, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy CBT, which is performed under the guidance of a therapist where patients are facilitated to change their attitudes and beliefs about sleep. This may include relaxation techniques, stimulus control and the removal of distractions such as mobile devices. For medication, a variety of medication has been found to treat insomnia, however with varying effects. Antihistamines may become less effective over time, while antidepressants may be prescribed by doctors together with CBT. Hence, beyond the current treatments of elderly insomnia, our group wanted to focus on a relative new treatment called Mindfulness-Based Therapy for Insomnia, or MBTI. MBTI, like CBT, is a multimodal, non-pharmacological-based program. The difference between the two is that cognitive components are replaced by mindfulness meditation and education in MBTI. The skills taught are to help patients learn to accept this sleep problem and in the process adapt to it by responding to sleep disturbances in appropriate ways rather than trying to change their behaviors to force themselves back to sleep. MBTI usually lasts for eight weeks comprising of three main components that revolve around education and practice of mindfulness on top of behavior training such as stimulus control therapy. MBTI is an evidence-based treatment that's clinically proven with successful clinical trials and case studies. So what about the limitations of MBTI? Well, firstly, there's a lack of public education and awareness concerning MBTI and its effectiveness in treating insomnia. Secondly, current MBTI programs are only offered in specialist sleep clinics or by psychiatrists and trained psychologists. CBTI is the only multimodal behavioral therapy offered by government-run sleep clinics or hospitals. Thirdly, current MBTI programs are too costly. This is unappealing for the elderly to enroll. All three healthcare agencies provide three types of therapy, good sleep hygiene, several behavioral approaches, and medical treatment. However, such therapies have also been shown to be less effective. And on top of that, mindfulness now seems to be more revolving around dementia, depression, and anxiety, while it has also been proven to be effective in treating insomnia. Therefore, including MBTI as an evidence-based therapy would, would even make you stronger as a healthcare agency. This multi-component therapy is usually conducted in a specialized sleep centers, but none of the government healthcare facilities offer MBTI. Therefore, we choose, uh, we choose National University Hospital, Singh Health and National Healthcare Group to provide this therapy. With many polyclinics and hospitals spread all over the city, which are located in densely populated and easily accessible neighborhoods, we think many elderly are more likely to seek help. Additionally, that with the help of such large healthcare institutions, it is possible to provide funding to set up an MBTI program and with greater access to resources, there can be an increased outreach and MBTI advocacy. All right, thank you. Thank you, Team 2, for your presentation. Right, um, we go to last group, uh, Team 5. Hi, Prof. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. Okay, good. I can see your screen. Yes. Um, okay, so we'll start now. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. So my group consists of uh, Benjamin, Jesse, myself, and Joey. So today we'll be talking about our program, Thermopoly. Okay, next slide. In other news, the police said that the top three common scams last year involving seniors aged 60 and above were phishing, social media impersonation, and investment scams. Amongst the victims of such scams was a 69-year-old woman who lost $40,000 of her life savings. The elderly are advised not to give out any personal information carelessly and are to remain cautious of suspicious behaviour. Wow, so much money. Looks like I better get my credit card number. Aya, girl, you don't remember my credit card number? If I send this in, I can get $500 voucher. Huh? Where got such thing? Say it Sure, I keep getting so many messages about it. I really want that $500. Ayo, pa, this is a scam. Don't, don't even believe them. How, how can it be a scam? Why would they message me if it's not true? This is so dangerous. There has to be some way I can make him understand what scams are. Welcome to Scamopoly. Scamopoly is a multiplayer scam team game when the player with the most money by round 10 wins. Here are the rules. Number 1. Pick a banker. This player will be in charge of all the money in the bank and will be the game master. Number 2. Each player chooses one token to represent them while traveling around the board. Roll both dice during your turn. Number 3. Each player starts with $1,500 divided as follows. Number 4. If a player passes through gold, they'll be given $200. Number 5. Land on a chance square and a banker draws from mystery pile without showing other players. Number 6. Land on a money square and you'll get an item card with value. Number 7. Try not to get scammed. This is the 7x7 board. The cards will be split into two piles. The money pile which contains the money card and item card and a mystery pile which contains a passive scam, action scam and police card. For our money pile, this will be how our money card and item card will look like. For the mystery pile, we have the passive scam card where the banker reads it to them. If they don't provide the correct answer, they will lose the money. There is an action scam card where the banker passes the card to the player who got the card and the player can use it against another player. If the other player fail, they have to give money to the scammer player. If the player pass, the scammer player will be sent to jail for one round. Lastly, there is the police or government card. It has protection cards, so if they fail the scam card, but they have the protection card, they won't lose money. It also has self-empowerment cards, where they learn new skills and will be given some money. The player with the most money by round 10 wins. Good luck and try not to get scammed. Ah, now do you understand how to spot scam? Yeah, actually I kind of know how to spot a scam now. Thank you so much girl. I now I can really save my money, alright? Okay, so if you play our game, please thumbs up using the Zoom reaction. Thank you. So I said in the video, the top three scams involving seniors were phishing, social media impersonation and investment scams, which has certainly worsened since the pandemic. Consequences of scams include the effects on mental health, social costs, and ability to recover. The theory that inspired our game was financial capacity, which suggests that normal cognitive aging may result in loss of financial skills and judgment. 
and we hope to curb this by improving the financial literacy and the resilience in Albany, which is the ability to cope and recover from stress and adversity of care. A study by the University of Edinburgh suggests that board games help to reduce cognitive decline in the elderly. They also found that it instilled sharper thinking and memory skills that help to protect overall cognitive health. All right, thank you. So as previously mentioned by her, uh, our program pilot uh, product is Schemopoly, which is a board game designed for elderly to help raise awareness of financial scams, help them to identify such scams and to help them to know what steps they can take in response to them. And our primary stakeholders are primarily children, adults or the elderly, as they will be the primary group to be playing with the product with them. This is our kind of our timetable for our program where we'll recruit children, adults, or the elderly parents, such as through institutions, word of mouth, or social media. And we'll also get the, them to do a survey before participation to kind of measure their financial literacy and capacity. Subsequently, a play test will be conducted a month long, and then we'll update and monitor our participants through social media. Subsequently, there will also, at the end, we'll have feedback to show that, we we'll have feedback to, to, to receive further uh, feedback so that we can further refine our product and program. So some of the strengths of our program is that board games has uh, historically been very relatively well popular and has been well received across generation and can cut generational device. And thus this has some social and emotional benefits as this can potentially reduce isolation and also they can stay connected through our workshops and social media. On top of that, we plan to, as a pilot program, we plan to keep our board games and workshops free of charge as an incentive for participation signups. And possible future stakeholders can include existing hospital programs, nursing home professionals, and social service workers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Group 5, for your presentation on scams uh, that will impact seniors. Um, I just see from a message by John that uh, your group hasn't actually finished. There was a crash. Okay, uh, you could carry on from where Floor left off, I think, group two. In the next, I think you have a minute and a half more. Group two. Hey, okay, Floor, just give us a while. Uh, let's set up my our. Uh, John, back one side. Okay, uh, I can start anytime, right? Go ahead when you're ready. Yeah, uh, so as seen from the table, there are possible ways whereby the stakeholders can help enhance MBTI. So with this understanding of what the stakeholders can value at, we aim to use multimedia such as the video, which part of it was shown at the start, to describe the issues brought upon by elderly insomnia, the current intervention measures and their limitations, and present how MBTI can be a promising alternative. By securing the partnership, we hope for MBTI to be a go-to first-line treatment for elderly insomnia, helping lessen the negative impacts that this sleep disturbance brings to the healthcare system, caregivers, and society at large. Conclusion. Our team recognizes that elderly insomnia is an issue that is projected to rise over the coming years, which will result in the proportional increase of social, economic, and caregiver burden. Hence, we identified that MBTI can be a potential effective treatment in the long-term management of insomnia beyond what is capable of current treatments. But to make it better, we intend to partner up with stakeholders in the government healthcare sectors so that we can garner financial and infrastructural resources to improve advocacy, accessibility, and uptake of this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Group 2. Um, let me ask Group 12 and Group 5 a question first. I come to Group 2. Um, who are your target audience? I didn't really catch uh, Team 12 and Team 5. Uh, your main one or two stakeholders. Uh, our main uh, target audience are government agencies like MOM who will be concerned about retirement planning in older workers uh, in Singapore. And then, however, we chose to use Facebook because we thought that the best way to get to uh, get our message across uh, to the uh, uh, government is through 
um, the feedback that the citizens give. So when we post out all these things on our Facebook, so such as questions and information, we hope that the, there will be citizens who are concerned and would respond and it will reflect uh, to what the MOM would want to know. Yeah. Got it. Manpower Ministry. Thank you. Uh, team 5. Hi, Prof. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. So our target audience is the adult children of the elderly because um, we think that they would likely be more receptive and like, they learn about these games faster so they'll be able to educate their elderly accordingly and like, you know, translate any necessary information to any languages if necessary. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Um, Team 5, you uh, has this, you have almost an invention of that game, right? Uh, Cost Game Mobile, right? Yeah, so I thought if you really want to get it going, uh, besides public education to adult children, you want to have some, you know, organization, you know, start somewhere. So something for you to think about. Just like I said to the, I think, earlier groups just now, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually good to have public education, but at the same time, uh, what goes public uh, needs to, when, when kicking off, have one or two, uh, you can say interested parties who could help kickstart uh, these things, you know, or, or or of course one one way to if there's no um uh, what you call it, interested or suitable parties out there, then you might want to think about forming some group or getting some people to form some group. That is an alternative. So something for you to think about in CA five, right? Um, question for group two or team two. Uh, your MBTI suggestion. I note that you you singled out Sing Health, National University Hospital, and NHG Polyclinics or NHG. Um, I just wonder why these three organizations. I mean, in healthcare, there are many other. I mean, there are other health clusters. Uh, you know, and also hospitals. Why these three? Uh, yeah. So, uh, actually, at first we wanted to do on Sing Health. Yeah, but because the main target was to expand this program into polyclinics. So there's actually uh, Sing Health, NUHS, and uh, the NHG that's running uh, polyclinics, so not just Sing Health. So instead, we uh, directed this advocacy to the custodians of all the polyclinics in Singapore instead of like just say Sing Health. I see. That, that, okay, that makes sense. So you're looking for NHG polyclinic, uh, NUP, or National University Polyclinics, not the hospital, and Sing Health polyclinics. Yeah, correct. So our main advocacy yep. is okay. yeah, mainly advocacy. That fine. That's that's fine. That that makes sense. Primary care. I think that's what you're thinking about. Okay, um, thank you uh, for the response. Um, I think this brings us to the end of tonight's uh, presentation segment and the final lecture. Um, we are now eight thirty-five, five past the time. So I don't think I want to go anywhere beyond this. I will make uh, the final closure of the entire course in the coming tutorial, right, uh, on Thursday. So we have our final session via tutorial on Thursday. Come to your allocated tutorial. Um, I just want to make a a, a good co a, a quick comment that um, I see fairly good to very good uh, uh projects that have been done. Uh, some of you showed parts of your video or project some of you shot the entire right um, regardless um, I could understand I could see that uh, in fact all of you understood the aim of the project and the uh, the requirements right so um, yep y the grading of course will be based on the criteria and there'll be some extent uh, of uh, we can say of assessment on each of those criteria for CA4 Right, but the, I think both, in fact, all of you have got, all the groups have gotten the, the basics right and the requirements uh, uh, included. So kudos to all of you. Right, so if there's nothing else further, just want to check if there's any further, um, anyone want to raise anything, uh, quick one before I call it an evening for all of us. Right, so if not, thank you very much for joining in and um, uh, this, I would say, presentation and partial simulation on uh, YouTube Live. Uh, this recorded video of tonight's session will remain on YouTube Live for some time and you could uh, enjoy your own presentation thereafter. I know some of you would be shy to do that, then that's fine too. Right, you, you can, after the end of the course, after you get your grade and look back and, 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 and see how you did, right. So um, that's all. Thank you very much. I'll see you on Thursday and we'll wrap up on Thursday. Right. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, Prof. Most welcome. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Prof.